In a thousand worlds and a myriad epochs, he always remained the probability man. Today on Dumpster Book Club, we talk about Probability Man by Brian M. Ball. I'm Sean, and across from me is Mimi, and this book is boring. should we start how should we talk about this book yeah. do you want to talk about the cover yeah this was a book that i picked out based entirely on the cover and the title yep unfortunately no math or actual probability yeah uh, i was really hoping there was gonna be some fun maths behind mimi are two giant books on probability and statistics <laughs> so um, this would have been a great book for us to read well, it the cover looks kind of similar to all these, like, psychedelic 70s, not popular sci-fi books. It was significantly less psychedelic than I thought it would be. It's not really psychedelic or 70s at all. But maybe all books like this aren't. <laughs> maybe it's just artists of the time. But there's um, a pretty neat pink planet flames are pouring out from it or some really eye-catching colors this neon pink and teal there's the sexy butterfly lady i forget her name ethel ethel she has some pretty crazy fire hair that wasn't in the book at all and there's our main character spin garn in his uh sexy devil man form with his disco shirt. He has a, what do you call it? Sequined? Yeah. Or a sparkle? A deep V-neck sparkle disco shirt. And he's wearing this weird belt that has like little ho- grommet holes on it. But then these bigger grommet holes with cords coming down from that I don't know what they would do. <laughs> On a pair of pants or where they go. (laughs) The Hot Topic grommet belt with nipple tassels. And there's a robot on it, but it doesn't look like how the robots are described in this book. In the book, he was covered in fur (laughs) that it fashioned for itself because robots are very fashionable in this universe. But on the cover, it's just a a regular robot, maybe because a big furry robot is bad design and the (laughs) artist just ignored it. And absent is our um, spinning top drill man, Sergeant Hawk. Yep. yep. Probably would not sell very many books if you saw a half drill man. Or maybe would sell more, I don't know. Oh, also mine... Mimi was reading the Kindle version, and I had a I had a cover or a, an actual copy. And on the inside, there's this drawing of this little like dragon dinosaur thing. That's not in there. Yeah, it's not in the book at all. I don't know if it's a DAW thing, but it's pretty adorable actually. <laughs> but it was pretty funny and pretty uh, bizarre, I guess. Do you think Brian and Ball is actually two people like? Brian and Ball, <laughs> like a co-op authorship, and this is their company, Brian and Ball and Sons. <laughs> um, according to his profile on the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, he's Brian Neville Ball, <laughs> born in 1932, England. He was a professor and lecturer before he started writing. This guy's a teacher? Yeah, and a freelance lecturer. A uh, freelance lecturer? Yes. What is that? Like, does he go to schools and tell them they did a good job when they graduate? Or what do you hire a freelance, le- oh, I guess, like self-help or something? Is doesn't he a self-help say what he, person? What, what he taught or what he lectured on. I mean, I, I could be a freelance lecturer. <laughs> I'll talk to you for hours about how bad this book is. You can pay me to lecture you. I'll lecture Brian and Ball about how to write a book. <laughs> uh, before this book, he wrote another series, uh, including t- 
timepiece, time pivot, and time pit. Do you think time features at all in those books? Uh, it says that they're about time travel and rebirth. So already the title of those is much better, where probability features not at all in this book. Though it's <laughs> stated many, many times. Or at least they use the word probability a lot. Do you think they just use the word time travel a lot in that book and never travel through time? Very possible. Is there anything else interesting about Mr. Ball? Um, no. He seems pretty boring. He did write a lot of individual books. And as of April, he's still alive out there somewhere. <laughs> still lecturing. <laughs> He wrote a series called Witchfinder. Wow. See, I would be interested in that book, except I bet there's no witches in it. <laughs> uh, it's only a two-book series with The Mark of the Beast and... All Planet right. Witch? Nope. The Evil at Montine. Do you think they find the witch? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <sighs> Shall we get into Probability Man? Oh, yep. You get a pretty good preview of what you're in for on the very first page of the book. The opening lines are, Mine, with a big-ass M. <laughs> Me. My. Mine. Mine. <laughs> mine. <laughs> That's how the book opens. <laughs> yeah. Those are the first lines. The seagulls from Finding Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> the whole opening of the book is pretty miserable. Throughout the book, you, you just don't get the information you need to figure out what's going on. And they sort of just piecemeal you information while repeating on stuff you already know. But the first two chapters are just... Miserable. Uh, we start off right off the bat with a hero with amnesia, which really gave, you know, the opportunity to kind of introduce the world as he re-remembers everything, but that opportunity is completely lost. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, amnesia is a, a plot point for people who aren't very good writers so that the reader who doesn't understand the world can be introduced to it along with the character and you could share like this knowledge but the no every knowledge everything every character knows is like hidden information except for sometimes like you learn things but not as fast as Spingarn and he doesn't share any of the things he learns with you until like the end of the chapter so it can be a cliffhanger every time he remembers something he says that he remembers it without explaining what it is that he remembers. And, uh, yeah, the first half of this book really over-explains things without explaining anything. Yeah, as soon as you learn something, you're reminded of that thing over and over again, like, in the same sentence. You'll get told this thing you already learned a bunch of times, except not told any, like, the things it's related to. I actually noted that, like, pretty much every every single chapter except for the adventure part of the book, which has a few change-ups, every single chapter has this same structure in which an event happens that was related to the cliffhanger of the previous chapter, and then some other mystery happens and they all are confused about what happens and then through either being Superman or like learning it from his memories that are very mysterious or whatever reason Spingarn learns something and he thinks about this thing without telling the reader and then everyone else is still confused and obnoxious and then eventually they annoy him so much that he answers them and in like a one sentence or like one word thing and then the chapter ends and then start over. <laughs> the whole hidden information thing doesn't really work because you're 
the things hidden from you are the plot most of the time. Yeah. Or why we're why we're doing any of this. Which is there is no reason for the first part of the book. There's really no reason for the second part of the book <laughs> well, either. At least the second part of the book, uh, there's a goal of some kind, and you kind of know the stakes somewhat. While our hero has amnesia, he finds himself in an 18th century siege of France, the Siege of Ternai. Which is... It's uh, almost an interesting siege, and you can tell that the author cares about history and ancient battles, probably, because more care is used in describing the scenario and the hardships of the people fighting in this battle than anything else in the book. I'm surprised that he doesn't have any historical fiction in his bibliography. But yes, our our main character is a foot soldier in this siege, he's trying to tunnel under the wall. It's really horrific and scary. He eventually realizes that he is inside a sort of virtual recreation of this battle. And that's the, the main setting of this book, is that we are in the far future, well past having to struggle for anything. All our needs are taken care of in some way. That's not really shown in the book. But because people don't have to struggle to live, they're too bored. So they have to go in the frames, which are supposed to be recreation, but the only recreation is recreations of historical battles. Work has been disinvented and machines do all the work. People have two ways of life. Either they work on the frames or uh, enjoy them, I guess. How could any of our needs be possibly taken care of by the machines in this universe? <laughs> I feel like nothing would get done. Um. Y- the absolutely useless robots. Um, okay. Uh, and all this, the frames and this universe where everyone survives or where everyone's needs are taken care of and these recreations, you don't really get that information. You just kind of get a bunch of historical garbage and then a bunch of sci-fi garbage. The book is pretty hard to parse unless... I just read the back of the book, which very clearly and elegantly explains basically the first half of the book. You could honestly read this and then skip 100 pages into the book to the actual start of the story. (laughs) Without having read the book, I couldn't imagine suffering through Act 1, I guess. Yeah, at the end of Chapter 1, when the siege starts to get a little dicey... Spingarn finally remembers that all you have to do is yell the safe word, um, which pulls you out of the plot into the timeout blip. Yeah, and the safe word is timeout. I don't know if that's actually specifically what he says. The, well, it changes. Because the first time he has to say, I want out of this plot. But every other time he calls for a timeout. Okay. Uh, so it's not not consistent and not clear. Like most of this book. <laughs> yeah. And so he escapes right before he's killed or going to be killed. And it's not really clear the consequences of being killed. I think I figured yeah. it if, out. If you die in the frames, do you die in real life? Yeah, he was in the first half of the book. He's really concerned about dying in the frames. But that seems like a terrible if everyone is in these frames and they're all recreations of old battles. It seems like most people would die. But I think it's actually only for him because he just didn't want to get he was like hiding in the frames and he didn't want to get found. So if he died, he would be like pushed out and he didn't want to be, I think. 
I think that's the reason. That's entirely speculation because it's never addressed. A lot of these scenes, it's not clear if there's supposed to be tension or not because we don't know what will happen. I think some things are supposed to be tense, but the, there don't seem to be any real consequences for anything, at least for our main characters, except for that one guy who gets horribly tortured. So a timeout is you can call for a timeout or whatever safe word the book decides and you can leave the frame but you have to make sure the person who takes your place doesn't die and again i think this is just for the main character but it's not stated so we can operate on the assumption that everyone has to do this and if the person who takes your place dies you get put back in the frame where that doesn't you're make sense. Dead. <laughs> so Is that not what it, it says? There's, <laughs> uh, we don't know what happens if you die in the frame, and we we don't know what happens if your replacement dies in the frame. Wait, really? I thought there was. I it, thought they, you would go back. But that, how does that make sense? Well, I'm not saying it makes sense. That's okay, just what the well, book said would happen. We know what would happen is you go back <laughs> into the frame. What happens after that is a mystery. Um, okay. Yeah. But he he successfully keeps his replacement alive by maneuvering the probability levers. So, yeah, it seems like the only way to really escape is that he has to prove that he has control over the plot using the probability levers or something which i don't think you're allowed to do he like tricked the robot except so in this universe it seems like robots will not do anything that they are programmed to do or that you want them to do you have to trick any machine or computer into doing the thing you want it to do either through flattery or physical violence, or the threat of reprogramming. All the robots have people personalities, but they've been given horrible people personalities. The first robot we meet is our main robot. He's in charge of the timeout. Later named Horace, but for now, he's called the umpire. (laughs) Oh, no, you're right. I'm right? If your if your replacement dies, you just get pulled into a different frame. Oh. That doesn't really seem like a punishment. No, there's no way that's right. Because only Spingarn was the one who could travel through frames. So I think that it's a specific scenario for our main character. This would all be great information to know in the book instead of just being told that he's chosen the name Spingarn 27 times. Uh, We'll get to that chapter. (laughs) Oh my god. Just looking at my notes and, and all the math words that he pulled into this thing that mean absolutely nothing. There's the probability levers... The probability curves. We get generating functions that don't mean anything. And uh, (laughs) it's pretty early on that we get really the central question of this book, which is why is Spingarn the probability man? A few times in the book, Spingarn decides why he's the probability man. But I don't think we are ever told but what he's a, he's the probability man. What does that I even mean? I think it mean? just means protagonist. <laughs> Protagonist. Because uh, he can accomplish the tricky probability maneuvers. Yeah, he can do all the probability levers. Um. So anyway, he times out and uses the probability levers to save the person who replaced him. But... For some reason, I forget, he's pulled out of the frame anyway, and he goes back to the real world, the 29th century. Yes. I 
don't think that was really explained, but I think it's because everyone in charge of this world is hunting him, and we don't know why, he doesn't know why. And then we meet Ethel and other lady, right? That's what happened next? Yes. Um, people from his prior life. He still has amnesia. Oh, we skipped the chapter. No, we didn't. We're getting to it. Never mind. Our, no, I think, we, I think we skipped it. Which one? There's a, one of the chapters in the timeout where he pulls the probably lever's lasts pages and pages and chapters and chapters. I think it's almost nine chapters long. <laughs> and nothing happens. Well, there's a whole chapter in which he decides he's going to keep using the Spingarn name, which is the character of the soldier he was playing in the frame and this chapter is a pretty good example of the terrible writing in this book it's it's throughout but this one was particularly bad in that we are repeatedly told that he's going to use the name Spingarn but never anything else he keeps hinting at some other information about learning about the timeouts or the frames or something he keeps suggesting because he he doesn't remember his own name. He can't remember his own life um, before this moment. So Spingarn is the character's name. And that's all he has. And the way this book is written, it's really hard to read because there's just so much stuff interrupting itself and all the sentences collide, but not in like an interesting way, just in a in a terrible way. I picked out an example in this chapter. He, comma, Spingarn, parentheses, in italics. And why not keep that primitive name, exclamation mark, parentheses, comma, could use the vain umpire's huge memories. I almost said mammires. <laughs> Which isn't so bad, but almost every sentence in this book is written this way, in which you start one sentence, sometimes just one word of it, like this one, where the sentence starts with he and then is immediately interrupted by another thought. Yes, and Brian Ball uses parentheses or dashes constantly to separate these ideas right in the middle of a sentence. And this is terrible... In this chapter, because this is near the end of the chapter, and we've already been berated with the fact that he's going to keep the name Spingarn. And why not? <laughs> and we're just trying to get to the action in which he pulls the probability levers, and they keep teasing us at it, and he just keeps <laughs> interrupting himself to talk about his dumb name. Every sentence... Is an episode of Narcos. <laughs> <laughs> There's sentences where it's interrupted with a dash for a new clause, and then that clause is interrupted with a dash for an even tinier clause. And it's really hard to read. It's really brutal. It would maybe be better if the things that were interrupting you were interesting. But it's never interesting. It's almost always stuff you already know being repeated to you. A lot of this stuff is just written as Spingarn's thoughts to himself, where he asks himself a lot of rhetorical questions or ponders things to himself repeatedly, asking himself the same questions over and over. You know, I guess in my brain I interrupt myself a lot, but I'm like a, an idiot. I wouldn't want to <laughs> read it my thoughts yeah we're getting someone's inner monologue with no editing <laughs> i um, guess that explains that one strange interruption just about a, a chinese woman's breasts oh that have God. nothing to do with the sentence or what was going on and doesn't even really make sense if you're in like an intergalactic yes empire that just an extremely jarring thought, uh, which I'm pretty sure came directly out of the mind of Brian N. Ball. He was just writing and had this one thought and then just kept writing and left it in. 
Is um, there an editor on this book? <laughs> no editor is listed in the beginning of the book, so it, this might just be pure, pure ball. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and our character with his amnesia and his overused memory cassettes... Memory cassettes? Oh, yeah. You don't remember the memory cassettes? That sounds familiar, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's like a cassette tape that they plug into the back of your neck. And if you do them too many times, it starts to mess with your real personality. Um, Are these part of the frames? Is this I a... think so. Okay, I... it's not like a brain expander? No. It's like to take on the role of a character, you get a memory cassette tape. And if you do it too much, it messes with you? Yeah. But this is the only thing people do, is the frames. Yes. Okay. (laughs) So this character with this messed up personality and amnesia, no real memories, is a completely blank slate, which really makes me think that he is Brian N. Ball. What it really makes you think of is how much of your personality is your memories and how much of it is ingrained. <laughs> what if this book is actually just a deep exploration of that? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not that. That almost sounds like a good cyberpunk book that I haven't read. Um, We've gotten way off track. I know. We had just met Ethel. Oh, God. You talk about Ethel again in a second. <laughs> and there's even something else in here about that. This was someone's, like, review of Brian Ball as a writer. Though he sometimes aspires to the more metaphysical side of the sci-fi tropes he utilizes. Oh. <laughs> Paul's style tends to reduce these implications to routine action adventure plots. I don't think he even I don't think Brian M. Ball has read the word metaphysical before. <laughs> um, okay, so where were we? Wait, but that review has stumped me a little bit. Maybe they weren't talking about this book. You can see a little bit where, like, he set himself up for a, a to explore a lot of ideas. He had all these seeds um, of what this book could have been, but then totally dropped the ball on all of them. I don't think I see them. Well, what seeds? Tell me the better book, Mimi. <laughs> Well, I think at first when he was talking about everyone just living in the frames, um, I thought maybe he was going to give some commentary about media consumption and people watching too much TV, but we didn't get any of that. He hints at these, like, the memory cassettes fusing with your brain and really messing up your personality or something, but that's not explored in any way, and... So, like, Ready Player One, but with irony. And not just a straightforward love story to (laughs) consuming culture. Uh, uh, maybe. I'm I'm almost (laughs) interested in the probability man as a cyberpunk dystopia in which people just do the frames all day long and there's an exploration of them erasing your personality and where your personality begins from memories and where it comes from evolutionary instinct. That sounds like a book I would actually read, but I also think it's a book that's probably been done. That doesn't sound like a very original idea, and I'm sure there's a lot of, there's at least a lot of cyberpunk out there where people just play video games all day. I wanted to talk about the frames a little bit, but I don't know. I don't know where we are we in can, this book we anymore. We can talk about that when we get to Maximilian. Oh goodness! Okay. 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 Back to what's going on. We've just met Ethel, the Dumpy Dump. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, poor Ethel. She seems to be Spingarn's 
love interest, but he has no memory of that, and all he can talk about in his head is how ugly this girl is. Specifically dumpy. Yes. We get dumpy about ten times. (laughs) But she's got a big old beak nose. Her eyes are too far apart. She's asymmetrical. She's fat. Well, in Spingarn's defense, a person with really spread apart eyes and a beak that is a dump (laughs) sounds horrifying. I thought when I was reading this, it's pretty, it makes you feel a little bad. I don't know if it's super offensive, but you definitely feel uncomfortable reading it, or at least I did. But I thought it was going to go a different direction. Like I thought it was going to turn out she was really smart and sort of the organization and brains behind Spingarn. And it like, it hints at that and it gets close to that. And then it's like, oh no, actually it is just Spingarn who's the genius and she's just there doing nothing yes we get kind of a a double twist it seems that she was the programmer behind his escape into the frames and due to this programming trick where he became essential to every plot whatever character he took over he he couldn't be captured so easily and Spingarn realizing that Ethel is responsible for this escape and not himself, that's the biggest shock that he's ever had so far in everything that he's rediscovering. Um, I'd be okay with Spingarn being a misogynist and then coming to realize that actually this dumpy beak lady is the one who helped him and did all this stuff and... (laughs) Maybe she's not so dumpy after all. Like that would be, it's okay Uh, to have a character that's a misogynist, but then. Maybe it would have been okay if he had some kind of character arc or like grew as a person as a result of this. Yeah. And it, it started that arc (laughs) and then the arc hit a wall (laughs) and died. Um, yeah. He, especially again, the amnesia was a totally missed opportunity since as he's rediscovering things about himself and realizing that before his amnesia, maybe he wasn't such a great person. He could have taken that as an opportunity to learn from his prior self and be a better person overall. It does start that arc a little bit too, where he's concerned about the kind of person he was before, but then he finds out, Oh, I'm just the best. Oh yeah. (laughs) I'm the probability man. But then it turns out that, Ethel really didn't do that much. It was his idea, even though she implemented it. Ethel's just a big, dumpy, beaked idiot. (laughs) Why does Spingarn, our narcissistic, misogynist, probability man, even like Ethel, is just later she becomes hot? We also Okay, the bigger question is, why does Ethel... Like him. He's horrible. No, he's the best. He's the (sighs) smartest. And he's super attractive because he got plastic surgery. Oh, right. Body shaping and slicing, it's it's called. Well, there's also another lady there who never comes back. Yeah. She actually has more dialogue in the beginning than Ethel. Yeah, Ethel mostly cries and complains. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if you had a beak and were a dump, what would you do? <laughs> the the meeting with Ethel sort of implies a conspiracy against Spingarn in which he's not allowed to when he's when a bunch of information is being held from him by the director of the frames, like the main head honcho of the frames. And he's not allowed to have certain information. Ethel lets slip the word Talisker, which he's not allowed to do. And it led me down uh, another thought of a better book. It sort of seemed like it was going to go a Total Recall kind of way, where I thought for a good portion of this 
first half of the book until I realized what kind of book it was. That he was still in a frame and he had chosen the frame where he is a plot director and there's some sort of like conspiracy against him. Uh, what was the book it's based on? So Philip K. Dick. We uh, can remember it for you wholesale. Yeah. Ball isn't so clever a, a writer. He had a very, in my mind, he had a very specific goal with this book. And it just took him kind of a long time to get, like, set the scenario <laughs> that he wanted to then write his book. Which is all this first half of the book is. He's just trying his hardest to vomit the setting up into the book and he can't he just keeps interrupting himself (laughs) with repetitive information he can't do it an editor would have really helped cut down this first half of the book it's so repetitive and unnecessary but what happens after the ethel thing he he escapes Except he's, he doesn't really escape. No, he's yeah, he's being held, and Ethel sneaks another robot to uh, slip him some more information to help him remember. Which the robot doesn't do of its own will. Spingarn again has to trick it into doing the thing it was told to do. Using the threat of physical violence. Yeah, he told he was going to have it reprogrammed or something. But what well, is the information the robot gives him? Oh, God. I don't think it... Let me check. If we ever get to the actual plot of the book happening, you will know that none of this information matters. None of the first half of this book matters. I don't think we need to tell the people what the robot told. No, it didn't matter. Um... But he escapes, and then we get our first comic scene. This book, I believe, is supposed to be a comedy. There are a lot of scenes that I think were supposed to be funny, And this is the first one. And I found this scene somewhat amusing, actually. Maybe that's the only success of this book, is this (laughs) one scene is fairly comedic. He meets Marvel, who is another plot director. And one of his friends before his amnesia. We didn't say... Spingarn is a plot director, which in this world, people have to make the frames that other people enjoy. And that is Spingarn's original job before he got amnesia. And apparently he's very good at it because he's the best guy. But it's unclear what a plot director actually does other than know history. I guess they're supposed to create the storyline and characters or something. But... Maybe. all. It only seems that Spingarn's concerns is things that are anachronistic and probability levers. It's never fully explained, and the little bits of information we get are contradictory because on the one side it seems like all of Earth's history has been lost and they're only able to put together these historical recreations using mismatched bits and pieces. But on the other hand, Spingarn cares very much about the historical accuracy and details in these historical Earth scenes. It seems as if a lot of history has happened between humanity leaving Earth and And this time period. The 29th century. But a surprising amount of the frames are specifically about battles that would be historical to us now mainly because i'm assuming mr ball is really into history and not particularly inventive of a person in that he had a book with a somewhat interesting idea but then did the most bland and boring thing with it instead of anything that would interest anyone yeah he does try to drop a few hints about other major galactic battles but None of them seem to really fit together or kind of have any impact on the way the world is now in the 29th century. Marvel, he meets Marvel, who is in the middle of working on a new frame. Some of the frames that we do get to hear about are Galactic Wars, Ancient Gladiator Battles, the Siege of Ternai, 
bumper car trains, uh, watch a supernova, dig underground like a mole, and a recreation of a 20th century police state. What do you think the watch a supernova frame is like? I'm going to go take the personality of a person sitting on a couch (laughs) watching a solar event. Or do you even think it's that far? Do they look in a telescope? I thought they would get, well... Get supernova <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of these advertisements also talk about the low percentage of survival as a perk, which is a little confusing, because we still don't know what happens if you die in the frames. Not having work is so terrible. I am so bored. Just kill me. <laughs> yeah. Let me die in a supernova. <laughs> I I don't understand why there aren't more fun fantasy frames. This is the best these plot directors can come up with. Yeah, I should have I should have figured out earlier on that this was not a total recall situation because that frame is way too interesting and complicated. <laughs> But talk about Marvel working on his frame. Oh. You were so... This was like the one part of the book that Mimi enjoyed, I think. Oh, my God. So, some of the artifacts he's recovered relate to... I don't know. Okay, how do we explain this? Well, it's a little bit fuzzy because they're trying to tell it as if they don't know what these machines are. Essentially, Marvel has strapped jet engines to steam engine trains, and they're flying around, smashing into each other. Right? That's... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what was (laughs) happening. He's uncovered historical records about bumper cars, and... Did he know about bumper cars, or did he just decide that was the best use of trains with jet engines? Oh, I thought I thought he he was trying to recreate what humans did on Earth, and he's working from historical documents about carnival bumper cars and steam engine locomotives, and just putting them <laughs> together in the best possible way. <laughs> Where. <laughs> Yeah, jet engines on these trains, ram them into each other at high speeds, and uh, that's it. That's the story. And this this is the first time you figure out that the frames are real. Before that, you aren't sure if they're virtual reality or what. And it still doesn't go out and say it, but the fact that he has constructed these things and is testing them with real people and later the Talisker situation, when you go into a frame, they give you your memory cassette, I guess, and you are put in a place where things are happening and it like really happens to you. But for some reason, you can then time out and exist again in the 29th century. Uh, I thought that they were, it was still somewhat virtual and I, Although the frames, they do talk about how much space they take up. And I thought that was just because he thought that the computers to run these things would have to be so massive. I interpreted it as they set aside physical space and people are given personalities and the the <laughs> necessary scenario is built and people enact them. I guess it could still be like kind of like walking into a computer, maybe like like the Star Trek. Yeah, like room. a hollow deck or like kind of like a Tron computer or something. Either way, this is a world in which the best and only entertainment is LARPing. <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's no alternative. The way that it's described, it's either you work as a plot director. Or you go ride the bumper car trains. (laughs) There's no one who, like, exists outside of the frames. There's no one who would rather just do anything else. Okay. So I thought the point of this scene was to show you that the frames were a real thing, as well as being comedic. And I think it's successful at being comedic 
not particularly successful at establishing how frames work. This is probably the best the book ever gets. Rocket powered bumper car trains. And the people in testing out these trains are dying horribly in the crashes. It just adds to the confusion of what happens if you die in a frame because it seems at this point that death isn't really a big deal. Life is cheap and people just die all the time because not having work is so terrible. But then there are a few parts in the book where people are really concerned about other people's suffering or death. And I just, I can't tell, am I supposed to care? No, I do know. You're not supposed to care about <laughs> anyone other than Spingarn. But well, he's the best. <laughs> Spingarn, like... One of the big disasters that he's in trouble for seemed to be altering the probability of a huge frame of a galactic war, and I guess the the probability curves that he manipulated changed the socioeconomic factors so that the war ended and not enough people were dying, which meant there weren't enough spots for new people to join people got real upset about it that that was a major disaster so maybe maybe you're not supposed to care about death or dying in the frames doesn't do anything and just those other times ball forgot (laughs) (laughs) or he needed it to be sad or something i yeah he he may have sat down and penned this whole thing in one draft and Oh yeah. Well, I mean all the that was that's Kafka's thing. All the best writers, you know, sit down and write their book in one sitting. <laughs> really, Mr. Ball is a student of Kafka and absurdism. <laughs> Do you want to mention what Marvel looks like? I forget. I imagine he looks kind of like this devil man but without the horns. He's a huge man, almost naked, wearing a single bejeweled codpiece. That's his work uniform. Do they describe how other people dress? No. In the 29th century? I think, I think Marvel was specifically dressing from some other historical period that Mm. happened between today and the 29th century. But we don't know what everyone else is wearing, but they're not wearing cod pieces. They could be. Well, it wouldn't be particularly interesting that Marvel was. Well, his is bejeweled. Oh. (laughs) <laughs> Everyone in this universe wears cod pieces, but Marvel is the singular person to have the idea to bejewel it. Uh. And then after meeting Marvel, he is hauled away by some guards to meet our head plot director. I think he's just the director of the frames. Yeah. They probably should have title. just come up with a different title than director, like so, president. <laughs> Executive director or... Senior director. Yeah, something. And the director has been turned into a horrible poop snake. (laughs) Yep. He's a snake, and he lives in some stinky yellow mud, and he spits stinky yellow mud. Oh, God. He has a forked tongue, red lips like a person, snake eyes, but with human eyelashes. I think he has a human mouth too. I yeah, think in human the end, lips. Human lips on a human mouth, not human lips on a snake mouth. Oh yes. Finally the book starts happening. We get introduced to the plot of the book, which is Spingarn in his previous life before having amnesia and trying to escape punishment for his actions by hiding in the frames. We find out that Spingarn had created a planet-wide frame on the planet Talisker in which the frames randomly changed to other frames. He didn't create them. He just kind of discovered them and reactivated them. They were actually already there, like an ancient planet of frames. Um, Which are sort of a mystery, like the history behind this planet of pre-existing frames wasn't really known. But he made them random? Um, No, he just reactivated them. They were already random? Yeah, he turned them on. They can't have already been random. Well, they were because of the alien. No, he did that with the alien... 
Okay, okay. That was Okay, so maybe they weren't already random, but we didn't we don't know what they were. It was just they they this planet of frames that was like really ancient. It was like a they describe it as like a mausoleum or something. This old dead place and he decides it'd be fun to start tinkering around and turning some switches on and see what happens. Spoilers. I'll put that when you say alien. (laughs) (laughs) Either way, he finds out that he created this planet where the frame randomly changes. And also, for some reason, in order to go to this frame that is a bunch of random frames, all your genes have to be randomly... Well, that happens when you enter the frame... When you when you go into these frames, the randomness. Oh, so your genes always get messed with when you go into frame, but to no. this one, it's random. No, just this one. Okay. <laughs> but like, you don't have to mess up your genes to go into it. By going into it, you mess up your genes. Are you sure? That's how the plot director got so messed up. That's how he got turned into the poop snake. He went <laughs> <laughs> he went into the frames and it messed up his genes and made him a poop snake. That's why he's so upset with Spingarn right now. And that's why Spingarn is in so much trouble. Okay. I, I guess I misinterpreted that. <laughs> but it seems going to this planet randomizes your genes... Yeah. Except it's not really random because there's a lot of the same stuff and I feel like you'd probably be something more horrifying than a poop snake most of the time. (laughs) That your genes are randomly arranged. Yeah. I'm not a geneticist. (laughs) Is that how you say that? I'm not a gynecologist, (laughs) but... Yeah. And I failed biology the first time I took it. (laughs) But I'm pretty sure that's not how genes work. <laughs> I also struggled quite a bit in math. I'm pretty sure this isn't how probability works. Uh, so... Why didn't they say probability a bunch of times when they were talking about randomly? Well, they they like to use the word random and random variable a lot. They use those instead. Yeah, the plot director is sending Spingarn into these frames. I don't think he really told him why. He just said he had to fix it. Okay, yeah. Get in there and fix it. And, and it has to be Spingarn because he's the probability man. That's the reason why it has to be Spingarn. But and we don't know why he's the probability what? man. <laughs> why is he the probability man? He's allowed to bring... He assembles his A-team. Yes, Dumpy Ethel. Which he's only bringing because he thought at this point in the book still that she was actually the brains behind all of his operations. We later find out that she was not, and she's not particularly useful in the adventure. He brings one of his sergeants from his 18th century siege. He brings his commanding officer from the siege of Tornai. Sergeant Hawk. And he brings the horrible robot umpire. (laughs) Really the only people he knows besides Marvel, who he doesn't seem to have too high of an opinion of. Yeah, because those trains were just too anachronistic. (laughs) That guy would suck on Talisker. (laughs) And then they go. Before they have their genes rearranged... The robot overlords come and visit Spingarn and tell him that they think there is an alien affecting the events on Talisker. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) That's going to sound really funny. Uh. And then their genes are rearranged and they are all turned into, I think they were supposed to be ironic portrayals of the characters. Mm. Uh, maybe I think that was Ball's mm. intention. Spingarn gets turned into a devil man with a razor tail. And little horns. And everyone finds him hideous. Although on the cover, he's pretty good looking girl. <laughs> Showing off a lot of chest hair. Yeah. <laughs> 
And Ethel is turned into a beautiful butterfly woman with huge boobs. Um, I, I think they're described as ripe, swelling breasts. <laughs> well, if they're not ripe, they're too hard. <laughs> Still green. Uh, and yeah, she can fly. She's got these big old wings. Uh, Which was, for Mimi, the grossest part of the book because they are insect wings and they are papery and... Uh, (laughs) Yeah. And uh, Sergeant Hawk gets turned into a giant corkscrew man that can spin by digging. He really gets the short end of the (laughs) gene stick. Something that I didn't make, uh, didn't really understand about the sergeant is that the entire time he maintains that 18th century knowledge of the world and mannerisms. But what was he before this frame? Wasn't he just a future person that picked this frame to go into? Yeah, I couldn't tell if he was a like a just a person experiencing the frame or if he was supposed to be like an AI or something from the frame. But he's the main comedic element of this book. Like he's supposed to be the funny part. He has all his lines. Then you see like God's boots or something all the God's time. God's bloody boots and gut bellied Spanish whore. <laughs> <laughs> And he calls everyone frogs as a derogatory for French people. Yep. And her robot remains unchanged. Still a furry robot. Yep. You can see what Ball was going for. Spingarn's actually, the you know, a bad guy. He's devilish. And Ethel has an inner beauty. And Sergeant Hawk is just a corkscrew man on the inside. <laughs> And here the book finally begins, because what this book actually is, is it is not a sci-fi book about frames or... Or memory or personality or media consumption or anything. It is a Jules Verne style adventure story in which a crew of characters go to an unknown place and exciting... Events happen, such as falling off a bridge or, you know, there's a monster they didn't that couldn't possibly be that is chasing them. And it is Brian Ball trying to one up Jules Verne by instead of just going to a new world or going back in time or they go to a planet that is completely random and changing all the time. (laughs) That's what the rest of the book is, is a series of set pieces of here's a danger. How are we going to escape the danger? We escape the danger. Separated by the frame shift, which causes everything to reshuffle. Oh, uh, yeah. Again. A new random danger happens. Um, but Ball's immense imagination is incredibly limited to a Lord of the Rings style troll. The thyroid giant. A balloon chase. (laughs) It's a steampunk balloon chase. Hot air balloons with brass levers. And then a Lord of the Rings Helm's Deep style ending battle. Um, there's a wolf man. There's ghosts. Right. So the first, the first danger they run into is they, some ghosts, some scary ghosts are coming at them. And the ghosts are actually incredibly important to the plot, but you only see them for a second, and they're not described. And then they just they just float away. They appear here and near the end of the book, but they are the motivating force of the plot that we have not learned yet. After the ghosts float away. They are walking along a bridge, and for some reason, they can't stay on the bridge. Well, because they're worried about the ghosts or something. I don't know. And they fall, and it's, you know, really exciting. Here, Horus the robot could save them with his rocket boots, but Spingarn fails to cleverly trick the robot into doing what he wants. 
a person who has grown up in this universe in which to do anything you have to cleverly trick a machine into doing what you want has forgotten this. I guess he had amnesia. We get a little bit of Brian Ball's reimagining of Asimov's robot rules. (laughs) And uh, the rules seem to be that the robots can't take any aggressive action against humans, and they also can't help unless the probabilities are right. So they can't help unless they're helping actually doesn't change the outcome. Unless you trick them. Yeah, you can butter them up. (laughs) Rub some butter on that furry robot. Oh, gross. Anyway, I don't think we need to explain every dumb adventure they have. Oh, no, I did want to talk about the giants for a second. Because in what is supposed to be a comedic scene and is darkly amusing at some points is mostly horrifying Sergeant Hawk is horrifically tortured by the giants. <laughs> uh. And Spingarn and Ethel are forced to watch, <laughs> waiting their own horrific torture. His metal corkscrew base is held to the fire, which he feels. Yes, there is plenty of description of the horrible pain he's experiencing and him crying and screaming. And then it's welded to a giant meteor. It's pretty funny. (laughs) At the same time, Spingarn discovers one of the, what are they called? The disaster control agents. Who were sent before him to try to fix the problem, but they weren't the probability man, so they couldn't do it. The agent gives us a little bit of information and explains or hints at the gene key, but once he finds out that Spingarn is the one that caused all this horrible randomness, he refuses to help and... And then dies. Yeah. And and, then uh, Spingarn pulls his leg out of its knee socket to find the hidden explosives that he knows are there. What are they called? Particle... (sighs) Was this the wave bomb? No. It's the one that... The temporary molecule dispersal field. Yeah, which disperses all the molecules in an area for some time and then reconstructs them perfectly. It spreads its load of time-bending seeds. (laughs) But it doesn't actually bend time. That's not what it does. No, it just says that. (laughs) It just blows stuff up. Then... And then they escape. Then there's a frame shift... Then there's the hot air balloons. Uh, Then they meet the alien, who is very unceremoniously introduced. Hey, are there aliens here? Yes, there are. And here's the alien. I felt that this chapter was as painful as chapter one because Spingarn is communicating telepathically in a yelling way with the alien. Yes, Mr. Ball tried to convey the difficulties of communicating with an alien life force and did so in the most horrible way, in the least clever way. Pretty dumb. And it really wasn't aided by Brian and Ball's writing style. Um, This was one of the passages I wrote down. Spingard breathed, then cried the question, and the words themselves floated in the emptiness, stark chunks of symbolism in a cosmos of bewildered, dash. The alien bewildered, double exclamation point, dash. Rage to know. There's a double exclamation point in this book? This book was full of exclamation points. Yeah, but a double exclamation There were triple exclamation points. Holy moly. (laughs) Message. The thing had a message. For him. For Spingarn. (laughs) That's four sentences. Also, the alien gets mad at him. The thing raged at Spingarn. You! With four exclamation points. Wow. You said it would find the way. Maybe my memory blocked out all this extra punctuation. (laughs) Anyway, the new goal is that 
Spingarn has to destroy the gene key. And we also find out at this point what the gene key is, because we didn't know what it was before. It is the thing that will rearrange your genes back to be a human. Yeah, it seems to give you some sort of control over the gene manipulation. Change yourself back, but... And Spingarn has to destroy it because those ghosts are trying to get into it so they can become humans because they like to eat human brains, and it would be really bad if there were some humans that ate human brains. That is the big bad of this book. It's are introduced s- right at the end. Are some ghosts that want to eat brains, and we don't want them to become humans that want to eat brains. We are in a universe in which we can repopulate a whole planet merely for entertainment, and there is an alien that transported from another universe, but our villain is some brain-eating zombies. Something that confused me about this part is how Spingarn came to all these conclusions, because it's not really revealed in his conversation with the alien. It seemed like he realized it or got this explanation kind of off-camera and just comes up with it later. Which isn't... I mean, that's par for the course. <laughs> that's par for the course for this book. That's that's par for the ball. <laughs> After this, the frames of this randomly shifting planet are now always shifting. So it is every second a new random scenario. But what that actually translates into is that Ball decides to stop describing the scenery or setting of anything. They land the balloon, and then he just stops. (laughs) They are just in a place, and it's really random. Trust me, I'm too tired to tell you about it, though. He doesn't want to slow down this exciting plot. Wouldn't want to interrupt a sentence with another (laughs) sentence. This bumper car steam engine of a plot. It's roaring ahead. (laughs) Because there's no setting or description of anything, they are at the gene key now. And I don't know if they knew to get there or landed there on purpose. Just the gene key is there now. And all the other people stuck in the random frames are there. And they are described as the giants. Flying dwarves with crossbows. Yep, flying dwarves. Poop snakes. A living supernova. A bunch of tiny people living in a floating crystal that shoots lasers. Did I miss any? Uh, Wolfman is back, maybe. (laughs) Um, And they're all fighting each other to get to the gene key. The gene key still isn't explained But it's described as a living machine. Like, it's something that's alive. Sounds like a better story than this one. Then they blow it up with wave bombs. (laughs) Well, first, all of these people are fighting each other to get to the Chien Key. I don't understand why. It seems like you could all just get into it or form a line or something. (laughs) But then the ghosts appear and are going to get into it. And for some reason, all of these people know that they have to stop the ghosts. And there's a big Helm's Deep battle full of poor descriptions of flanking moves and wave bombs. (laughs) And they kill the ghosts with no particular effort. I think a lot of flying dwarves were killed. I thought everyone was killed. No, most of them survive. How'd they survive the wave bombs? I don't know. Well... And then they blow up the gene key because the alien told them to. And then all the people who survived are mad at them because they wanted to go back to being humans. And then Spingarn calls timeout. They all were real humans, right? Spingarn, he started diverting people who died in other frames into these frames. Yeah, I think they were all real people turned into poop snakes. But we don't care about people dying. Right. I don't think. Do we care about people being poop snakes? That apparently is a very bad thing. To be a poop snake is the worst thing that can happen to you in this universe. Well, they all get out by yelling time out. That was all they had to do. Yes. Well, no. Only Spingarn and his crew get out by yelling time out. Everyone else is stuck on Talisker forever. 
Oh, yeah. And they go to meet the frame director, who is still a poop snake, and he is mad at them because what they were actually supposed to do was not destroy the gene key, and he already knew about the alien. Except he didn't tell Spingarn that he was supposed to get the gene key or even about the gene key. So, you know, that classic scenario in which someone really wants you to get them a Christmas present, so they start hiding <laughs> catalogs around the house instead of just telling yeah. you what they want for Christmas. But then he's real upset that Spingarn didn't do what he was just like to my do. aunt was real upset that i got the wrong color sweater for her <laughs> um there was some interesting stuff at the end i'm not too sure exactly what it meant so right when they get out they think that they've succeeded spingarn proposes to ethel because she's hot now but he says that he wants to mate and marry which is probably the grossest proposal I've ever heard. <laughs> right. And also Ethel, I remember, is very happy about her change. She wants to keep what she's got. Yeah, it doesn't... Like, why didn't she just get her plastic surgery then? Yeah, it was pretty inconsistent with her character. Her character didn't grow either. She's just not dumpy anymore. Yeah. Then there's this passage... After Spingarn proposes that they mate and marry, she points out that their union might well be objected to by the breeding selection directory, if only on the grounds of their aberrant physiques. Then it says, a physical assault had convinced her that she was wrong. What? So, what does that mean? <laughs> Does that mean what I think it means? It sounds like it means what you think it means. It sounds like he said, will you marry me? And she says, I'm not sure. And then he hits her and then it's okay. Then it moves on. The end. Happily ever after. That's when there's the twist that all this seemed too easy. Yes. The, the Which... alien... Actually didn't want... No. Seems a little disrespectful to everyone who died and Hawk who was horrifically tortured. All this really didn't matter and we didn't accomplish our mission and we have to go back. Yeah. Sequel, baby. Sequel, definitely. Planet Probability. <laughs> yes, we actually have Planet Probability also. But I do not think I want to read it. Is there anything else you want to talk about, Probability Man, before we f close out, before we finish up? Uh, while I was reading it, I felt like there was a lot of similarities uh, between this book and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I've never read it. I imagine it is a bunch of British jokes about... Ha ha, so random. What a silly situation. Well, in that, there's the improbability drive, which uses that same kind of magical probability that does whatever to as a device to replace like a warp drive or faster than light travel. But it kind of serves a purpose and is... Maybe it's actually funny. Yeah, but... And then there's just, there are some other kind of minor similarities like pl having planet-sized computers or Ethel's kind of like the Trillion character or something. And then there's Hawk, our sergeant, as the wacky Zaphod Beeblebrox. There's like the comedic relief type character. Which is kind of the more I thought about it, it was like... Is he just ripping off this other author, but Probability Man actually predates it by seven <laughs> years? <laughs> so... I don't think there's any way Douglas Adams read this. No. Even uh, from just watching the the movie that I've seen, I, I don't even make the connection you're making. Uh, yeah. In fact, I don't really connect this to any sci-fi books i've read i mean there's the obvious classic sci-fi influences and sci-fi stuff but it's not really other than maybe uh 
my mistaken identification of Total Recall or the other one. I don't think it's much of a relation, but I thought like this whole alien plot, some of the stuff would be served better in like a cheesy space opera. Like, no. af- <laughs> <laughs> uh. well, maybe not. But if you just took that one part of the plot, the actual space opera is the alien Spingarn helps the alien and it breaks free. And then it turns out it's an evil alien and we all got to get our spaceships and destroy it. Well, I think instead of rating the book or anything, we would try to decide who the book was for. Maybe both its intended audience and who we think would actually enjoy it. Who do you think this book is for? (sighs) (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, it seemed like Brian Ball might have intended this for children. Sorry, I made a face. <laughs> the wacky fun adventure. But yes, but just all the weird misogyny and sex stuff. And the torture and you No, know, there's Redwall has some torture, I think. Oh, it does. It has some pretty horrific violence as I remember. But not any weird sex stuff. And maybe the misogyny is fairly downplayed. <laughs> yeah, the physical assault. <laughs> <laughs> Domestic violence. Are there female characters in Redwall? Of yes. course. Yeah, there's the there's like the Lady Badger and stuff. Yeah, okay. Of I just course. had to think about it. There's Mariel Redwall, which was my favorite yeah. of the books. Yep. So I'm not I'm not sure about that. I wouldn't recommend this book to children. Who would you recommend it to? (laughs) Uh, Your answer can be no one. (laughs) Well, this book might be for someone who thinks random means wacky. Uh, I don't know. Sounds like you're recommending it. For somebody you don't like. (laughs) Mimi recommends this book as torment for someone that she doesn't like. Uh, You're sentenced to read The Probability Man (laughs) for your sins. Who do you think this book is for? I really think Ball's intention was to do a silly adventure book. And the beginning of the book was him struggling to set up the scenario he wanted to have a always random world. I think his intention was a sort of light sci-fi sword and sorcery market. Like people who also read Princess of Mars or Princess on Mars or whatever. The Edgar Rice Burroughs stuff. I think he intended it for that audience. But I don't know if I know a person that would enjoy this book. (laughs) I think I would have to say this book is for no one. It's not even that bad. I've read worse (laughs) bargain bin sci-fi books. Way worse, even. Just the problem is, other than the bumper train part, there was... There was no enjoyment to be had, and the writing was so challenging in a way that made both you and the author feel dumb. It's not It's not even worth, like, a light, easy sci-fi read or just, like, a cheap beach read or whatever they're called. It's just a, a short but boring and frustrating experience. Well gave it a five star review <laughs> on oh let's let's not call out people okay. on fine you're right but i recommend this book for he's the only one the only five star review this book was written for that's who <laughs> that's who i think this book is for well you look at his picture oh gosh <laughs> don't put this in there but he kind of 
kind of looks like Brian Ball. <laughs> oh, no. That's his alter There's, ego. He has photos of his family. Oh. It is Brian and Ball giving himself five star ratings as a secret. <sighs> well, he's got a photo of himself in front of a wall of what appears to be covered in garbage science fiction books. So maybe this book is for people who love garbage science fiction books as an art form. (laughs) Welcome to Dumpster Book Club, where we judge and humiliate (laughs) people who like books that we don't like. (laughs) Just don't put that in there. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sure (laughs) is a wonderful man. So I think that's it for Probability Man. If you want to join us next month for a spooky Halloween episode, we're going to be reading Hobgoblin by John Coyne. See you in a month? That's it. That's it. The end. <laughs> <laughs>